So I'd like to welcome everyone to Burke Idea Talks, Perspectives on Genetically Modified Crops. Uh, my name is Jerem Ferriante. I'm a member of Burke, which is the Berkeley Energy and Resources Collaborative uh, student group here on campus of over 3,000 students. And uh, the food that we have in the back is from the Berkeley Student Food Collective. And Skylar Hoffman has a few words to share with you about the, the non-GMO nature and healthy nature of the food you're eating. Speak in the microphone since it's been recorded. The Berkeley Student Food Collective is a place right across the street from Eshelman Hall on 2440 Bancroft Way where you can come and you can not only talk to people and get to know people who are passionate about amazing food, but you can also get this amazing food. So all of our food purchasing policy follows the real food guidelines, meaning it's organic, local, humane, and fair, which together imply sustainability. And it's, of course, GMO-free, because that's what we're all about, is good, good, real food. So come on by the storefront. You can get sandwiches, one different sandwich every day of the week, and your local, your general grocery needs. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Skylar. So like, like many of us, uh, uh, we are somewhat, a lot of us are probably so, somewhat new to uh, GMOs. Uh, for example, how many of you six months ago knew what GMO stood for? Some of us, yes, yeah, not, maybe not all of us, but it uh, stands for Genetically Modified Organism. And uh, I, for one, lear uh, started to learn or become aware of GMOs and issues around them through uh, various organizations. One was uh, the, the Institute of Responsible Technology, of which uh, Jeffrey Smith, our speaker today, is a, a founder. And another organization was uh, GMO, GMO, uh, labelgmos.org, which is an initiative campaign to put uh, labels on foods containing GMOs. So this event is an Idea Talks event. It's uh, somewhat of a new initiative uh, through Burke to discuss different types of issues which are uh, very relevant today. And uh, through discussing these events, uh, to create new opportunities for student research, and and uh, we hope to follow up this uh, Idea Talks event, a uh, lecture by Jeffrey Smith, with a more intimate and interactive workshop on the very same topic. And so make sure to leave us your email address. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the back if you are interested in more events like this one. And also in the back, you'll find that uh, you can learn more about the Berkeley Student Food Collective and also the labelgmos.org uh, uh, organization. And there are also uh, books for sale, uh, which, uh, of which Jeffrey Smith is the author. You can learn more about them uh, back there. And so without uh, uh, further uh, ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Jeffrey Smith, who is an international best-selling author and is the leading spokesperson on the health dangers of genetically modified organisms. Uh, Mr. Smith has counseled world leaders from every continent, campaigned to end the use of genetically engineered bovine growth hormone, and influenced the first state laws in the United States regulating, uh, for regulating GMOs. Uh, Jeffrey Smith has been a popular guest on TV shows worldwide. He has lectured in more than 30 countries and has been quoted by government leaders, and hundreds of media outlets, including the New York Times, Reuters News Service, BBC World Service, and he has also been quoted, quoted in scientific publications, including Genetic Engineering News, Nature, and New Scientist. With this, we proudly present to you our speaker today, Jeffrey Smith. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I tweaked my back last night in my last lecture, and so I want to do this sitting down. <laughs> but I made it anyway. Um, I've never made an entrance like that. <laughs> I thought I had, it was a lot of fun. I should try that again. Actually, I needed someone on the other side to push me out, and I go, Wee! and then fall off the other side of the stage. <laughs> uh, how many people are concerned about eating GMOs? Raise your hand. How many people are not concerned at all about eating GMOs? No one. So we don't have the representative from the biotech industry here or from the biotech department. OK, we'll have to do without it. How many people here come from a farming family? 
Great. How many people are gardeners? How many of you eat? <laughs> Almost everyone. This affects everyone, whether you're growing food or eating food. And not just in this generation. When you put a GMO out in the environment, the pollen can cross-pollinate, the seeds can fly, and we end up cross-pollinating non-GMO crops of the same and relative species. So it's not just those who eat now, it's those who eat any time in the future that may be uh, dealing with the folly of this generation. The genes already released can outlast the effects of global warming and nuclear waste. And this infant science is now producing products that are being fed to more than a billion people. When GMOs were first introduced, <clears throat> when it was first discovered that we could transfer genes between species, scientists met in a, in a meeting in California and decided to, to govern themselves, to regulate themselves and not allow these genes to be escaped into the environment because it was such a new and radical concept that there, we were creating organisms that were not part of the billions of years of evolution but creating new organisms overnight that didn't follow the, nor the normal segregating laws that keep certain genes in some species and certain in others. But soon after, some companies like Monsanto decided not only to release them but to put them into the food supply. And so this technology actually has an unprecedented exposure. It can influence everyone who eats, every organism, and all future generations because it changes the ecosystem both in the environment and inside our bodies. When we think about such an amazing deployment of GMOs, we would hope that those who were in charge of their regulation hesitated and delayed the approval until all of the concerns were dealt with, until there was an overwhelming consensus of safety and protection, because it's an irreversible deployment. You cannot go and recall the genetically modified contamination of the indigenous corn varieties in Mexico, discovered at first by Berkeley professor Ignacio Chapella. You cannot recall genetically modified salmon if it escapes into the ocean, or gen genetically modified mosquitoes that were released in the Cayman Islands in Malaysia. Once released, it's irreversible. So we're going to talk about what level of caution and regulation has been used in preparation of introducing this, these products. And the products include the four main ones, soy, corn, cotton, and canola, as well as sugar beets, which produces the most, most sugar in the United States, as well as zucchini, crookneck squash, Hawaiian papaya, and most recently, alfalfa, which is used as hay for animals. Before I go on, though, I want to get a sense of your personal buying patterns in relationship to GMOs. I'd like you to rate yourself from 1 to 100 how vigilant you are at avoiding GMOs. Now, some of you eat in dining halls. Some of you eat out a lot. Some of you buy all of your food at, at supermarkets. So let's just make it any time you eat. One number, what is, what is the, your self-rating for vigilance? One is not vigilant at all. You don't pay attention to the issue. 100 is extremely vigilant. Now, the average American on a scale of 1 to 100 is minus 7. They don't even know that their foods are genetically modified. Most of you, I'm guessing, would be in the lowest category, 1 to 20. So how many are in that category? Raise your hand. Almost everyone. How about 20 to 40? 40 to 60? 60 to 80? 80 to 100. All right? So we have most people 0 to 20. And then almost equal representation in the other categories. And how active have you been in educating people on the GMO issue in your lives? One is not active at all. 100 is extremely active. So how many people? That would be most people would be 1 to 20. How many are 1 to 20? Raise your hand. Not very active. 20 to 40? 40 to 60? 60 to 80? 80 to 100. So almost everyone is 0 to 20. 
very few are in the other categories. So this is a pretest. We're going to see how vigilant you want to be next week after hearing the talk and how active you want to be as well. Now, when we look at why GMOs came to the marketplace in the 1990s, it was based on this one sentence by the FDA. It basically says, we're not aware of any information showing that GMOs are significantly different. Therefore, no safety studies whatsoever are required. No labeling is required. Companies like Monsanto, who told us that their PCBs, Agent Orange and DDT were safe, can determine if their own GMOs are safe, put them on the market without labeling and without even telling the FDA. So this was basically a complete open door on the basis of the concept that they had looked all over for some significant difference and found none. Therefore, they wouldn't treat GMOs differently than other crops. This was the May 1992 policy, and it still is in force today. And it's a lie. It's a complete fiction. It's been proven to be a fiction. The entire introduction of genetically modified foods is based on deception. Thousands of internal documents at the FDA became public from a lawsuit in 1998. And these documents revealed that the overwhelming consensus among the scientists working at the agency was not that GMOs were not different, but that GMOs were significantly different and dangerous. That they could lead to allergies, toxins, new diseases, and nutritional problems. They urged their superiors to require long-term study. But they were ignored, and their warnings were denied. Why did that take place? Now remember, they were warning about a new infant technology that would be fed to everyone in the country, and perhaps everyone on Earth. And the genes would cross-pollinate to other crops and through the generations to everyone. And they had concerns and were ignored. Why was that? The White House had been convinced by the biotech industry that GMOs were the key to increasing U.S. exports and U.S. domination of world food trade. So they instructed the FDA to promote biotechnology. The FDA then created a new position specifically for one person, Michael Taylor. Monsanto's former attorney. While he was in charge, this policy came to pass. He then worked at the USDA on biotech issues and then became Monsanto's vice president. He was put into a new position by the Obama administration. He's the US food safety czar. The person who I believe is responsible for more food-related illnesses and deaths than anyone in human history is in charge of US food safety. Now, the scientists at the FDA were concerned about GMOs, but they didn't have any data to back up their concerns. Now, there has been data collected. The American Academy of Environmental Medicine decided to look at that data. This organization looks at new disease outbreaks, new toxins in the environment, and puts them together. They were the first organization to identify Gulf War syndrome, food allergies, chemical sensitivity, and about 18 different discoveries that have since become accepted. And after looking at the documented health risks of genetically engineered foods, of the animal, animal feeding studies in particular, they declared that the relationship between disorders in the laboratory animals and the GM feed was not casual, but causal. They said that GMOs were linked to reproductive problems, immune system problems, accelerated aging, organ damage, gastrointestinal problems, and other disorders, and asked all doctors to prescribe non-GMO diets to every patient. We have spoken to many doctors that prescribe non-GMO diets, and they are very excited about the improvements they're seeing in a wide variety of ailments. 
We'll talk more about those after we've had a chance to look at the data ourselves to draw our own conclusions. Now the first GM crop that was evaluated in the voluntary consultation process at the FDA was the Flavor Saver Tomato, designed for longer shelf life. This was the only company that gave raw feeding study data to the FDA for evaluation. They did a rat study and the rats refused to eat the tomatoes. It's not a unique experience. Farmers all over the world say that many animals, when given a choice, avoid GMOs. Cows, pigs, elk, deer, squirrels, raccoons, mice, rats, geese, buffalo, and chickens. So it's our job to get humans up to the level of animals. In my book, Seeds of Deception, before every single chapter, I have a little one-pager called Wisdom of the Animals where I describe the eyewitness reports. And there's a description of how squirrels in Iowa in the coldest part of the winter refused to eat the corn cob that was genetically engineered but kept eating the non-GM corn until the farmer didn't put out any non-GM corn anymore and the squirrels just stayed away for 10 days from the GM corn and finally nibbled a few kernels but that's all they could handle. Someone else decided to repeat the experiment in Illinois, bought a bag of corn on the cob that was genetically engineered and corn on the cob that was not, put it in the workroom and forgot about it. So long after the winter, they discovered the bag and found that the mice had done the study for them. They had devoured the, genetically mo the non genetically modified corn and left the GM corn untouched. Getting back to the tomatoes, they force fed the rats the tomatoes and 7 of 20 developed stomach lesions, 7 of 40 died within two weeks. Now, in the UK, they wanted to convince a skeptical public that GMOs were safe, and so they gave a $3 million grant to this man, Dr. Arpad Pustai, to figure out how to test for the safety of GMOs. He was the world's leading researcher in his field, and he worked with 20 or 30 scientists in three different institutes to develop the protocols that were supposed to be implemented into the EU regulations so that any GM crop that was approved in Europe had to go through his testing protocol. As part of his research, they took a potato engineered to produce an insecticide. And they fed that genetically modified potato to a group of rats along with a complete and balanced diet. A second group of rats had non-GM potatoes and a third group had non-GM potatoes plus the diet was spiked with the same insecticide that the GM potato produced. So you have GM potato, non-GM potato, and non-GM potato plus insecticide. Only the group that ate the GM potato got sick. What was the cause of the problem? It was not the insecticide. It was somehow the process of genetic engineering the potato that caused the potentially precancerous cell growth in the digestive tract, smaller brains, livers, and testicles, partial atrophy of the liver and damaged immune system in just 10 days. You can see on the right side of the slide the proliferative cell growth and altered cell architecture in the, in the intestinal walls. You can see on the right of this slide how the rat's stomach lining was dramatically bigger. Now, Dr. Pustai was invited to speak on television. And with permission from his director, he was interviewed. He did not go into the details of his study because it was not yet published. He did indicate that he wouldn't eat these GMOs himself and that he didn't think that the population should be used as guinea pigs because he had seen the research done by industry that got their foods approved and found it so poor and so superficial it was actually a turning point in his life. He was totally shocked that GMOs were being put on the market with such flimsy research. And he knew that his potatoes, if tested by industry, would have made it onto the market without any problem because they never checked for these things. And he also knew that the soy and corn that were on the market in the UK 
were created from the same process that he used to create the potato. And remember, it was the process that caused the damage to the rats, not the particular insecticide. So he was very concerned about the health of the population of the UK and spoke about his concerns on television. When that happened, media all over Europe started to cover the story. Here was a leading scientist, the person on earth who was evaluating how to test for the safety of GMOs. His job was to figure out how to test for the safety, and he said they were not yet safe. And yet they were in the food. He was a hero at his prestigious institute, but only for two days. At the end of the second day, the UK Prime Minister's office made two phone calls to the director. The next morning, the director fired Dr. Pustai after 35 years, silenced him with, a th with threats of a lawsuit. They never implemented the protocols in EU regulation. Instead, they withdrew the data from Pustai and his team and dismembered the dismantled the team. For seven months, he was unable to respond to the campaign designed to destroy his reputation and protect that of biotechnology. But finally, by an order of parliament, the gag order was lifted. He was invited to speak before parliament. And he got the data back, and it's now published in The Lancet. And it remains the most in-depth animal feeding study yet on genetically modified foods. Now, the story of Dr. Pustai is retold in a new film called Scientists Under Attack, which came out in the United States two and a half weeks ago. It's available in the back. It talks about two scientists. One is Ignacio Chapella from Berkeley. How many people have heard of him? So he has a very interesting story. He discovered the contamination of the corn varieties in Mexico accidentally with his graduate student, David Quist, and submitted his findings to Nature and just before it was published, he was going to tell, he told the Mexican government what was going to happen so that they could be prepared to respond. And he described to me the scene when he was summoned by a senior Mexican government official who tried to intimidate him. According to Ignacio, the official implied, we know where your children go to school, trying to get him not to publish the research. He finally, he published it anyway. He's a hero. And then, maybe it was coincidence, the email system for Berkeley went down. He couldn't, he didn't know what was going on at the time. But as soon as he published, two doctors, Andura Smetichek and Mary Murphy, began posting inflammatory and false information about Chapella on a listserv, a probiotic listserv with thousands of doctors, scientists, claiming that he was an activist, that he had lied about his research, and he was doing it to fulfill some sort of agenda. And they rallied all these scientists to appeal to nature to retract the paper. It turns out Andura Shmetacek and Mary Murphy do not exist. They are the imaginative incarnations of Monsanto's PR firm, the Bivings Group. And if you track the email identifiers for their postings, it goes back to the Bivings Group, and one goes actually back to Monsanto's headquarters. So it was a job des designed to destroy Chappelle's reputation. And uh, there's a lot more to his story, and that's also told in Scientists Under Attack. And it just came out. It's available in the back. I mention it because... I think it's very important for the people of Berkeley to know what happened to Ignacio Chapella as a reminder of the corporate influence that may pervade this and other campuses around the country and around the world. So what I want to do is talk about five categories of things that can go wrong with GMOs. And the first we've already discussed, and that's the process itself. Let's say you wanted to create a corn plant that produced its own pesticide. 
You take a gene from soil bacteria. The bacteria is called Bacillus thuringiensis. It's already used as an insecticide. How many people have used BT in their gardens? Anyone? Not anyone here. You can spray the bacteria, it kills insects, then it washes off and biodegrades. But what they do is they take the gene that produces the BT toxin that breaks open the stomach of insects, they make millions of copies, put it into a gene gun, and blast the gun into a plate of millions of corn cells, then clone the corn cells into corn plants. And now every cell of the corn plant has a little spray bottle that produces the BT toxin. Now, whether you insert by the gene gun method or bacterial infection, and then followed by cloning, the process itself causes massive collateral damage in the DNA. Two to four percent of the DNA is different by the time you've genetically modified it. Hundreds or thousands of mutations can occur up and down the DNA. Hundreds or a thousand different genes can change their levels of expression just from the process of insertion and disruption. Now, when this occurs, it can cause changes in the RNA, in the proteins, in the metabolites. So you can have higher levels of allergens, toxins, anti-nutrients, disease-creating elements, the same concerns they were voiced by the FDA. Now, in Monsanto's most popular BT corn, they didn't check to see which genes had changed levels of expression before they approved it. They don't evaluate these things. They just hope that it's not going to cause something that's a problem. But it did. A gene was switched on that's normally silent and now produces an allergen in our corn supply. In fact, 43 different genes now significantly overproduce or underproduce their levels of protein. And some protein in the corn is truncated. It has a completely different size. And when you change the structure of a protein, you can change its effect on the body when it's consumed. So you can change a harmless protein into a deadly one. None of this was evaluated before the corn went on the market, and none was followed up after this study, published in a peer-reviewed journal, finally did an analysis of the proteome and found these changes. Monsanto did look at a number of key pieces in the soy before they introduced genetically modified soy into the market and wrote an article in the Journal of Nutrition in 1996 claiming that their GM soy was substantially equivalent to non-GM soy. Well, it turns out they rigged their research in ways to specifically confound any difference. They pooled samples from many locations grown in different climate and geographies, guaranteed to increase the, stati the statistical noise. But in one of the studies that they talked about, they actually grew GM and non-GM soy side by side in the same climate in Puerto Rico. But none of the data was there. They just described it, but didn't include the data. The data that was included, however, showed clearly that there were dramatic changes, both in the composition and the effect on animals between the GM and non-GM soy. But in the abstract, in the title, and in the conclusion, they said there was no difference. A medical writer discovered in the archives of the Journal of Nutrition the missing data and found that with Monsanto's cooked GM soy, it had as much as seven times the amount of a known allergen, trypsin inhibitor. It had about twice the amount of a known anti-nutrient, soy lectin. It had lower protein, lower um, phytoestrogens, other things that were different, that were obviously not something that Monsanto wanted to put into its peer-reviewed published study, or it might not have been approved. Both the soy and the corn have higher levels of lignin. The metabolic pathway that produces lignin also produces a plant pesticide called rotenone, which is linked to Parkinson's disease. Now, the second cause of problems with GMOs comes from the gene itself that you insert. 
it produces a protein, and that protein may be completely new to the food supply with unintended effects. Now, there are two primary traits that are genetically engineered. There's the Bt toxin, which we talked about, which is in two types of plants, corn and cotton. Most of the other GM crops are herbicide tolerant. That's over 80% of all GM crops are designed not to die when sprayed with herbicide. So Roundup Ready soybeans don't die with Monsanto's Roundup herbicide. Let's take a look at the Bt toxin to see if it's a wise choice to put an insecticidal toxin into the food supply. Now, the regulatory agencies and the biotech industry claim that Bt, because it's been used in agriculture for decades, has a history of safe use and therefore must be safe. They claim that it's species specific, that it doesn't have any effect on mammals, including humans, and that it's destroyed during the digestive process in mammals and humans. Well, it turns out these assumptions are contradicted by peer-reviewed published studies. About 500 people who were sprayed with BT in the Pacific Northwest had allergic or flu-like symptoms. Mice fed BT showed tissue damage and immune responses. But the BT in the crops is thousands of times more concentrated than the spray form. It's designed differently to be more toxic. It has properties of a known allergen. It doesn't wash off. Now, when they fed BT corn to mice, the mice have immune system responses. The Austrian government fed BT slash Roundup Ready corn to mice and the mice had fewer babies and smaller babies. Monsanto's rat study, which they claimed showed no problem, when the raw data was re-evaluated with proper statistics, the scientists said it showed signs of toxicity, particularly in the liver and kidneys, and immune system activation. Thousands of farm workers in India who pick the cotton plants that produce the Bt toxin are complaining of the same allergic and flu-like symptoms as the 500 people in Washington and Vancouver who were sprayed with gypsy moth sprayed BT. You can see the itching on the bodies of these Indian workers. I compared the, the symptoms between those who were sprayed with BT and the Indians, and it turns out it's nearly identical. They allowed animals to graze on the BT cotton plants after harvest, and thousands of sheep died. One small NGO did a study with nine sheep, three eating Bolgard 1, three eating Bolgard 2, and three non-GMO cotton. It was the plants after harvest. All six sheep eating the GM BT cotton died within a month. The three eating the non-GM had no symptoms. In the state of Haryana, according to investigators, videotaped interviews, veterinarians, and uh, several investigations by media, buffalo there are dying or having disorders after eating the BT cottonseed cake. I visited a village in Andhra Pradesh where they had allowed their buffalo to graze on non-BT natural cotton plants for up to eight years without a problem. Their buffalo were grazing for a single day on BT cotton plants. Within three days, all 13 buffalo died. I asked the, the villagers, how many of you personally have experienced itching while working in a BT cotton field? And most raised their hands. And they also mentioned that they lost 26 goats and sheep. Now, we talked about some of the unpredicted side effects that can influence health. But they can also influence the agronomic qualities. And there's been a lot of problems with BT cotton in India. Monsanto bought up Mihiko, a seed company, and pushed their BT cotton with a huge promotional campaign using Hollywood actors and spiritual leaders and 
deceptive ads, which we now have identified using fake farmers and wrong statistics. But they've convinced millions of farmers to borrow money for the more expensive seeds and associated, ke associated chemicals. And many of the farmers are unable to even pay back their loans, and some of those commit suicide. The UK Daily Mail estimated the number of suicides in 2008 as 125,000. Father Nashiva estimates it now at quarter of a million. There are other reports, anecdotal evidence, of problems with BT products. The BT corn in a farm in Germany supposedly was responsible for the deaths of 12 cows, supposedly responsible for the sterility of pigs or cows on a couple of dozen farms in North America, supposedly was responsible for the symptoms and of a village of 100 people who breathed in the BT pollen and found distressful problems in the intestinal problems, fever, digestive problems, etc. They also said that their animals suffered deaths and there was unexplained human deaths. The same seeds were planted in four more villages and the same symptoms returned during the time of pollination. Now the third reason why GMOs may be a problem is that the protein that's produced in the new organism after you transfer the gene may be very different than the protein that's produced in its original environment. Now one reason is that the transgene, which has the code for the RNA, which has the code for the amino acid sequence, which is then folded up into a protein, that initial code can get messed up because the process of insertion can cause mutations and truncations in the transgene. So Monsanto's BT10 corn, 30% of the transgene was lopped off and it produces amino acid sequences that were never intended. Others have scrambled codes. Others may have rearranged spontaneously. The cell may read it differently or produce multiple RNA as happens with Monsanto's soy, not tested before it went to the market but now we know it produces RNA that was completely different than intended and four different versions. Even if you assume that the amino acid sequence is what you want, and that's what they do, they assume it, they don't even sequence it in many cases. The, the amino acids may be folded differently or have different molecular chains formed to add, you know, molecules attaching to it. These things can have dangerous effects. As experienced in Australia, where they took genes from kidney beans and put them into a pea to produce an insecticide. These peas had passed all the studies that are normally done before a GM crop goes on the market. So it was ready to be introduced. Fortunately, the developers decided to do one more study that no food, GM food developer has done before or since. They did an advanced immunological study on mice and exposed the protein from the original uh, kidney bean to the mice and the mice had no response. They took the identical protein and this time they did actually test the amino acid sequence and it was the same as that in the bean. But the identical protein when exposed to the mice cause an inflammatory immune system response, suggesting that the harmless protein had somehow become potentially deadly and might create a deadly anaphylactic shock. So they decided not to deploy the peas in the food supply, which would have been shipped from Australia to India, but did some further investigations and found that the sugar chain that attached itself to the protein had a subtle change in its pattern called glycosylation, and they blamed that on the problem with the peas. And they were still very surprised that there was such a dramatic change after swapping genes from such closely related species. When reporters asked Monsanto's European representative to comment on the peas, he said the, the fact that the peas were discovered to be harmful 
shows that the regulatory system works. It turns out that the regulatory system is a complete failure because none of Monsanto's products had been tested with this advanced mice model. And they could easily be causing deadly anaphylactic shock and we wouldn't know it. And they don't take genes from closely related species, they cross kingdoms. They take genes from bacteria and viruses and put them into plants. The fourth possible problem is that the herbicide tolerant crops have more herbicide residues within the food. It's not just on the outside, it's within the food portion of the crop. Now, a herbicide tolerant Liberty Link corn was fed to chickens as part of their study and twice the number of chickens died. But this was an industry funded study. The industry uses tobacco science. They rigged their research to avoid finding problems. And this study was no different. It was designed so poorly that even a doubling of the death rate was not considered statistically significant. Now, the use of herbicide tolerant crops is resulting in herbicide tolerant weeds. So now the weeds are not dying when sprayed with the normal dose of Roundup. And so farmers are using a lot more Roundup and other chemicals to kill these weeds. In the first 13 years of GMOs, there was an increase of 383 million pounds, but that's accelerating dramatically. It was up 31% in the last year of the study. Now, I want to tell you about Roundup because it's actually not the benign substance that Monsanto has been telling us. It was originally patented as a chelator in 1964. A chelator binds with, in this case, a broad spectrum of minerals, nutrients, and it hugs them and it doesn't let them go. It makes them unavailable to the plant. And the primary way that it kills weeds is that it deprives the plant of essential nutrients, making the plant defenseless against diseases. At the same time, it promotes diseases in the soil which overrun the plant. So it creates a perfect storm. Now, it does not biodegrade in the soil, even though Monsanto advertised it in two continents that it did, and two courts in both continents declared their uh, advertising as false advertising. It can survive for months or years in the soil. What is the main component of the food supply for the U.S. livestock? It's Roundup Ready crops. Soy, corn, cottonseed meal, canola meal, sugar beet pulp, alfalfa hay, all Roundup Ready. Now, the crops themselves do not have sufficient nutrients. They're nutrient deprived. So the animals are now in a, eating a nutrient deficient diet and veterinarians are seeing a serious problem in a lot of animals in the US and they send the organs, the livers for testing and there's no detectable manganese or universal depletion of manganese. You can see from this graph a dramatic reduction in the uptake and movement of zinc, iron, and manganese. Here's a list of more than 40 crop diseases in the United States that are on the rise because of the use of Roundup. And you can see on the right a field that's been sprayed with glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, for 10 years versus the left, which is one year. There's, an accumul there's a cumulative reduction in the capacity of the soil to produce healthy crops. Now, Dr. Don Huber wrote a letter, a secret letter to the Secretary of Agriculture that was leaked onto the internet. So because of that, we can now talk about this, which was supposed to have been private. There are animals, livestock, all over the United States that are unable to give birth. They have spontaneous abortions. And when they send the aborted fetal tissue into the laboratory, they're finding this new organism, the size of a virus with visual properties of a fungus, something never seen before in science. And it appears to be a causative agent. They've done what's called Koch's postulates, where they took a chicken 
pregnant chicken, exposed it to this particular organism, it killed the fetus within 24 hours and forced an abortion. They've also found this particular organism in high concentrations in plants that are diseased, with the diseases known to be promoted by Roundup. And they're finding this organism in higher concentrations in Roundup ready crops and Roundup treated crops. So there may be a link between Roundup, this organism, plant disease, and spontaneous abortions. Now the fifth possible problem that we'll talk about tonight is that genes might transfer into the gut bacteria or even to the human cells after we eat it. Now this was a serious concern to the, Amer to the FDA scientists. They were concerned about the antibiotic resistant marker gene used in most GM foods. They were concerned that this marker gene might transfer to pathogenic bacteria rendering the disease untreatable with antibiotics. But they were told by the biotech industry, don't worry, genes are destroyed during digestion. There's no need to be concerned about gene transfer. Finally, a study was done on human beings. It's the only published feeding study on GMOs. And they did it to test to see whether in fact genes were destroyed during digestion. It was a brilliant study. They took seven volunteers who had elostomy bags. They had their lower intestines removed, not for the study. <laughs> and they fed them a soy burger and a soy milkshake, genetically engineered, looked into the bag and were surprised to find how much intact genetically modified soy had survived passage through the stomach and small intestine. But in three of the seven volunteers, before they were fed the meal, embedded in the DNA, of the bacteria living inside their intestines was the Roundup Ready gene. Some previous meal or meals had caused the gene that confers the Roundup Ready property to transfer to their gut bacteria and their gut bacteria did not die in the presence of Roundup, suggesting that this was a functional gene. This means that long after we stop eating genetically modified crops, we may have these foreign genes produced continuously inside of us. Now, they never tested beyond that. This was a UK government funded study. As soon as they found that, it took years to publish and they never allowed any follow-up. So they never checked to see if the BT gene in corn chips transfers to our gut bacteria, turning it into living pesticide factories. However, a recent study out of Canada found that 93% of pregnant women had BT toxin in their blood and 80% of their fetuses also had BT in their blood. The authors suggested that it was probably consumption of milk and meat from animals fed the GM corn. But many scientists doubt that because it's hard to believe that that much BT protein is available in an identifiable form through that channel. It may be so, we don't know. Perhaps a more plausible explanation is that we're colonizing the gut bacteria of North Americans with BT toxin, with the genes that produce the BT toxin. I gave a talk last night to a group of mothers and there were two doctors on the panel, a pediatrician and a family practitioner. And both said that they have seen permeability in the digestive tract on the rise in the last few years. And they believe that that is the reason why there's so much more food allergies and autoimmune diseases and a host of other problems. Some completely new problems that are now commonplace. And they believe that GMOs are the likely candidate and they believe that BT may be the culprit. Let's take a look at the evidence for problems with GM soy. Soon after GM soy was introduced to the UK, soy allergies skyrocketed by 
No follow-up research was done to see if GMOs were the cause, but we know several reasons why they might be. When you fed GM soy to mice, the pancreas produced dramatically less enzymes that are used in digestion. If there is a reduction in the ability of our digestive system to break down proteins, the proteins can last longer and have longer period of time to create an allergic reaction. If that's the case, the GM soy may be responsible for an increase of allergic reactions to a wide variety of foods. In one study, they found a new allergen that was in GM soy, but not in non-GM soy. But it needs to be followed up because it was preliminary. Another study, we discussed this, Monsanto's own study, showed a seven-fold increase in trypsin inhibitor in the GM soy. But even the Roundup-ready protein produced in the soy fails the World Health Organization's criteria for evaluating an allergen. It has properties of a dust mite allergen, so it might be a triggering allergic reactions in those of us who are allergic to dust. And that is the protein that's produced continuously inside of our intestines if, in fact, the gene is transferred in a functioning state. Mice and rats both showed liver problems, changes in the liver cells when fed GM soy. One was published by a team of Italian researchers with mice. This is a rat study that was not published. The scientist was told she was not allowed to publish any more research on GMOs because I'll tell you about her story in a moment. But she passed this picture on to me after we both gave a presentation at the EU Parliament. And it's really clear to see the gnarly liver on the right. That's a technical term, gnarly, on the right for the rats that were fed GM soy. She gave me this photo of rat testicles that changed from pink to blue after being fed GM soy. And we know that when mice were fed GM soy in an Italian study, study as well, they had changed testicle cells as well as damage to the young sperm cells. And in a Brazilian study showed changes in the uterus and ovaries of rats fed GM soy also published. The young embryo offspring of GM fed parents had DNA that functioned differently compared to those born of non-GM soy fed parents. These are Russian speaking rats from that same woman. She fed these female rats genetically modified soy starting two weeks before they got pregnant and more than half of their babies died within three weeks compared to a 10% death rate with the controls. The babies were also smaller on average and they could not reproduce in a subsequent study. Now she was of course attacked, vilified, Documents were burnt on her desk and samples stolen from her laboratory. And she was told by her boss, who was under pressure from his boss, no more research on GMOs. One of her colleagues tried to comfort her by saying, well, maybe the soy will solve the overpopulation problem. She was not comforted. One of the criticisms of her work was quite valid. She never did a biochemical analysis of the feed. So we don't know if there was some mycotoxin or some contaminant in the bag of Archer Daniels Midland soy flour that she used in her experiment that might have been responsible for this astounding reproductive disaster. But after completing the same research study three times with similar results, coincidentally, the supplier of the rat chow to her laboratory switched its source to become 100% GM soy. She couldn't do any more studies. But after two months, she had the brilliant idea to ask her colleagues, what's your infant mortality rate in your studies? It had jumped to over 55%, suggesting that there was not a particular unique toxin in her flower that caused this reproductive failure. Hamsters fed GM soy for a period of three years, for two years. By the third generation, most lost the ability to have babies. They died at four or five times the rate, some had hair growing in their mouths. This is not yet published. 
It was reported in a, in a, in a conference. If GM crops are so bad, why don't we see more problems? Well, we saw huge problems in the 1980s with a food supplement called L-tryptophan taken off the market because it was responsible for the deaths of 100 Americans or so. Five to 10,000 fell sick or became permanently disabled. It took four years to discover, and yet its symptoms were screaming to be discovered. It created a completely new marker, unique, acute symptoms that were fast acting. It was the perfect combination. In fact, you would need all three. If it were not a unique problem, let's say it was cancer or heart disease or diabetes or autism, how would you know if it was something new in the environment? No one would track whether you're taking a food supplement or if, it's, if those things are on the rise because of GMOs. No one's going to ask, have you been eating? Because GMOs are in 80% of the foods in the supermarket, usually in small quantities. So if GM soy and corn were responsible for the doubling of food-related illnesses in the United States between 94 and 2001, or the near doubling of multiple chronic illnesses between 1996 and 2004, or the increase in gastrointestinal problems or reproductive problems or autism or food allergies, we would not know. And if it were related to non-acute symptoms, like frequent colds, we would have no idea. Or if it took three generations, like the hamsters, we would have no idea. Because there's no human clinical trials, no post-marketing surveillance, no evaluation of all the changes that can occur in the crop itself. Approvals are based on assumptions and rigged research. Now I'd like you to rate yourself how vigilant you'll be next week <laughs> at avoiding GMOs. How many will be low vigilance? One to 20, raise your hand. Two. 20 to 40? Two, three, four. 40 to 60? 60 to 80? 80 to 100? The largest category was 80 to 100. Before I spoke, the largest category was 1 to 20. Now, you'll notice I didn't talk much about the environmental impacts of GMOs. We'll talk about that in a moment. But I have a specific strategy and reason why I talk about what I do. And I'll discuss that in a moment. And it's based on the re results we just got here today. Oh, let me ask you, I'll ask you to rate yourself on the next question in a few minutes. So let's take a look at the environmental considerations. You have changes in the soil biology. Genes can transfer potentially into the soil. They've been found in organisms in the soil. Bt toxin binds with clay and can remain active for months or years. The Roundup primary ingredient, glyphosate, kills beneficial microorganisms, promotes soil born pathogens, can reduce the bacteria that's known to cause a kind of spongy absorption of water, so that might increase the tendency for flooding. It decreases the biodiversity. For example, in the Midwest, there's hardly any milkweed left. There's such huge, vast acreage of Roundup fields, corn and soy, that are sprayed with Roundup. It kills all the other plant biodiversity including the milkweed, which is where the larvae grow for the monarch butterfly. So we have a potential to wipe out the monarch butterfly. If you look at Argentina, where they have miles and miles, ocean of, so of sterile soil, sterile fields of soy. No insects, no birds. Also, the biodiversity is wiped out because of the tendency for farmers to just buy every year and not save seed and create their own, character, own characteristic seed because when you buy GMOs, you sign contracts with the company that you won't save seed. And the biotech industry intends to target the 1.4 billion farmers that save seed. They want to introduce Terminator technology which allows a crop to produce sterile seeds. So that could take the huge biodiversity that we have 
and knock it down to a very thin number of genetics, risking the world's food security at a time of global climate change. Superweeds are one aspect that we've already talked about, new pathogens, water pollution, glyphosate can stay in the water, Bt can be carried away in the water, and one study showed it can adversely affect the mortality and morbidity of caddis flies in the marine, in the marine ecosystem. And of course, there's the irreversible contamination. Economics have been a disaster. The U.S. has had to spend three to five billion dollars extra per year to prop up the crops, the GM crops that no one wants. It does not increase farmer income on average. In some cases, it decreases farmer income, reduces exports. The non-GMO farmers have to pay extra to protect their farms and their crops through segregation and testing and buffer zones, and then they have to pay for contamination. The cost of contamination can be huge. The, least, the most recent settlement from Bear Crop Science for contaminating the long grain rice supply in the U.S. was $750 million after they've already paid out more than $100 million to others. The total price tag is around a billion. Same with Starlink corn contamination. The average GM crop does not increase yield. It actually decreases yield. And it does not feed the hungry world. The most comprehensive evaluation of agriculture, the ISTAD report, more than 400 scientists over several years concluded that the current generation of GMOs have nothing to offer to feed a hungry world, to promote sustainable agriculture, or to eradicate poverty. The seed prices have gone up dramatically. Super weeds are taking over. And it's a disaster. There have been cotton losses all over, deformed cotton, and, and overrun by pests, as one example. And the spraying of glyphosate in the Roundup Ready regions is now linked to birth defects and cancer, dramatic increases with follow up, follow -up studies. And the glyphosate itself, when tested in laboratory animals and cells, is linked to uh, endocrine disruption, a death of placental cells, etc. So how do we avoid eating GMOs? We have in the back a shopping guide, one free shopping guide for everyone, and one free health risk brochure, which describes some of the dangers. The citations of that health risk brochure are available on our website at responsibletechnology.org. We also have an iPhone application that's free called Shop No GMO, and we have a website called nongmoshoppingguide.com. How do we stop the genetic engineering of the food supply? We believe that we can accomplish it by a tipping point of consumer rejection. And here's what we mean. Remember that picture of the guy who was supposed to come up with the protocols for testing GMOs? He had tested his rats and they had proliferative cell growth in the stomach and small intestine. When his gag order was lifted on February 16, 1999, it changed the course of events in history. Three weeks earlier, at a biotech conference in San Francisco, a company circulated a white paper predicting a 95% takeover of all commercial seeds in the world within five years, a plan to replace nature. But when the gag order was lifted, 700 articles were written in UK alone, many others throughout Europe, very few in the US. But in Europe, a huge GMO safety scandal made headlines. And that was sufficient to cause a tipping point of consumer rejection by the European food companies, generally within a week. Within a week after the announcement by Unilever that they were going to remove GM ingredients from the European brands, then Nestle's, then so many other companies. It took the biotech industry by surprise. And that is why they have not replaced nature, because of the consumer revolt in Europe that led to a change in the policies of the food companies. A similar tipping point 
has befallen Monsanto's bovine growth hormone, driving it out of most of the dairies in the United States, kicked out of Walmart, Starbucks, Yoplait, Dannon. And Monsanto sold it off, <clears throat> realizing its days were numbered. So we are seeing now the early signs of a tipping point against GMOs in the United States. The Nielsen survey revealed in 2009 that the fastest growing store brand claim on their products was non-GMO. This year it's the third fastest overall claim in products sold in the grocery store and the fastest growing claim in products sold in the natural food sector. Supermarket News predicted in 2009 that 2010 would see an unprecedented upsurge of consumer awareness and concern and they attributed that in large part to our shopping guide. Their prediction came true. <clears throat> We've never seen the level of concern and awareness that we saw in 2010 which is now exploding in 2011. Doctors started prescribing non-GMO diets in large numbers. The American Academy of Environmental Medicine came out with their statement. Many other doctors are now prescribing non-GMO diets. We believe that education is the key. And what gives us confidence? What happened here tonight? This was a turning point in many of your digestive lives. We just had a mini individual tipping point where you may be ready to abandon brands that you've grown up with simply based on about 45 minutes of evidence based on facts and peer-reviewed published studies primarily. Just by telling people the truth, people are ready to change their diets. Now, what percentage of the population do we need to convince in order to drive GMOs out of the U.S. like they were driven out of Europe? We think it's only about 5%. Here's why. The same companies, Kraft, Nestle's, McDonald's, Burger King, they remove GMOs in Europe, continue to sell GMOs here. But they're aware that anti-GMO sentiment can take off and turn GM brands into liabilities. So if they see a drop in market share of any percentage that they can contribute, they can, they can attribute to a growing sentiment against GMOs in the U.S., What's to keep them to use GMOs? There's no consumer benefits. You have the poison drinking herbicide crops, the poison producing BT toxin crops, a few viral protein producing crops like papaya, zucchini, and crookneck squash. No one is clamoring for their daily dose of GMOs. And if they start getting rid of them, they're not going to label it low GMO. They're going to get rid of it quickly if they think it can catch hold here. So we think about 5% of U.S. shoppers avoiding brands that contain GM ingredients will be sufficient to get Kraft and others to quickly remove GMOs. And we think that that is completely achievable because we now have sufficient evidence of harm to convince the average American to avoid GMOs. Actually, the average American is already convinced to avoid GMOs. 53% say they would avoid GMOs if they were labeled. Well, we have a portable labeling guide now. But if even 9 out of 10 percent of those, 9 out of 10 of those 53% are lying, we still get our 5% for the tipping point. Who do we go after for the tipping point? The most receptive groups. Parents of young kids open-minded professionals in the healthcare industry, their patients, health-conscious shoppers, certain religious groups that think GMO really means God move over. <laughs> Green groups, progressive chefs and restaurants, campuses that led the way for years on new movements. So we can get rid of GMOs without having to convince anyone who's resistant. We just give people what they want. Most Americans want to know if GMOs are, lit, are in their food. 95% of, of Americans want 
GMOs to be labeled as such. So we give them what they want, the labeling, and we tell them why it's good to avoid GMOs. So we've packaged this information into books, DVDs, CDs, articles, blogs, and it's just a matter of passing it on to other people. So now I want to ask you to rate yourself from 1 to 100 how active you'd like to be in educating people about GMOs. How many people would like to be low active? 1 to 20, raise your hand. 20 to 40? 40 to 60? 60 to 80? 80 to 100? So 60 to 100 was the most popular section. 60 to 80 or 40 to 60, somewhere around there was the most popular. Let's say 40 to, 40 to 80. And it was the most popular before we started was 1 to 20. So this tells us another thing, that we have the capacity to inspire action and participation in the empowerment of the consumers in the United States. And that's what's happening. We've never seen these many people get active. We have the Tipping Point Network, a non-GMO Tipping Point Network, with about 2,000 people signed up. And you can go to our website, responsibletechnology.org, and sign up for that. You can sign up for our newsletter. Have we passed around the uh, sign up? Maybe we can just have them in the back because people are pretty far apart from each other. You can sign up for our free newsletter. We can send you information about the Tipping Point Network. And for those people who want to form or be part of a group to get active in some aspect of GMOs, whether it's on campus, in the community, or be part of our national groups, each focused on a different targeted demographic, like parents or campuses, please come to the front at the very end, and we'll get your names, and I'll give you some information as to how to get involved. So we are seeing an unprecedented number. We've taught 700 people how to speak on GMOs in one-day workshops or four-part webinars. We're having one uh, second weekend in November, somewhere in San Francisco, right on the Sunday of the Green Fest. We haven't picked the location yet. You can also call our office and take it online. We can give you the links to the webinars that have already taken place. 700 people have signed up and done that, and done that or similar trainings. We have October as non-GMO month. There are rallies all over the country. There's a rally in San Francisco on October 16th, which is World Food Day. It's taking place on 97th Street on the corner of Mission and 7th at October 16th. And Ronnie Cummins, the director of Organic Consumers Association, will be speaking. And Pam Larry will be speaking. Pam is an amazing woman. I saw her last night in Marin when we spoke there. She had what she called an epiphany. And on January 20th, in San Francisco, woke up and said, we need to get labeling on the ballot. And so two months later, she went public with one person trying to get labeling on the ballot in California. And now she has about 70 groups around the state. And that's probably going to be on the ballot in November. So there's opportunities to get involved with the ballot initiative in this town and all over California right now. Now, if you want to know more about the Right to Know World Food Day rally, um, it doesn't have a long URL. It has a tiny URL, which is impossible to read to you. You can go to, you can email righttoknowgmos at gmail.com or you go facebook.com Right to Know GMOs SF. And there's basically there's handouts in the back. So you don't have to memorize anything. You just go to the back and they'll give it to you <laughs> and then you can show up. Um, if you're going to Bioneers uh, on Sunday, I'll be speaking there with Andy Kimbrell and we're going to have a meeting of activists there as well. So we believe that knowledge is the answer. Consumer education is the answer. And we've created a variety of ways to convey that. I have the storybook, Seeds of Deception, which became the world's best-selling book on the subject, and stories of corruption and takeover at the FDA and fired scientists. And then the more text-like book, which is called Genetic Roulette, which summarizes 
65 different health risks with a summary on one side of the page and documented evidence on the other with citations so people can go through it quickly or in depth. We're trying to create materials for the right brain reader, the left brain reader, the iPod owner, the person that likes to just watch movies. We want to create it in such a way that it's really easy to connect and to spread the knowledge. You can be a click and send revolutionary or you can be organizing events and marching in the street. There is a rally, there is a march on Washington now. Launched two weeks ago in New York on Saturday, I was there. They have marched 16 days and they're going to be in D.C. on Sunday in front of the White House. And rallies that day all over the country. There are over 400 organizations that have gotten together to put a petition before the FDA to label GMOs. Many of you have gotten that in your inbox already. I've gotten it in my inbox 11 times. It's a lot of organizations. So what we're seeing now is an unprecedented upsurge of consumer awareness and concern about GMOs. What we're seeing now is the early warning signs of a tipping point. What we're seeing now is the opportunity for us to get involved in a movement that can protect not just everyone who eats, but all organisms in our environment and all future generations. So I'm grateful for speaking here at Berkeley to give you an opportunity to evaluate this for yourself and to get involved, to protect yourself from the dangers of GMOs and to protect our globe from the legacy of the folly of GMOs in this generation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, and uh, I can pass around this microphone and uh, if just raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Testing. I've been buying organic corn for several years, but I feel in the last few months that I'm losing confidence that it's possible to have uh, corn that isn't corrupted by GMOs now. So organic products are not allowed to intentionally use GMOs, but pollen does not read the sign. Uh, sometimes the organic grower will buy seeds that are already contaminated, or they'll plant their corn next to GM corn and not have sufficient buffer zone, or, you know, corn pollen can fly for miles, actually. So it's not possible to be 100% sure that a corn product is non-GMO. But we still recommend organic as one of the tools, one of the tips to avoid GMOs. If it's contaminated, it's probably a tiny percentage. But organic products do not require the label, the testing of GMOs to see if it's contaminated or how much. So there is a third party verifier called the Non-GMO Project which we highly recommend. There are over 5,500 products that have been enrolled in this new system. In order for a product to be listed in our shopping guide, it must be enrolled. So if you see a product that is organ labeled as non-GMO project verified, it means that it's designed in a system to meet the standards. Even then, you can't guarantee 100% absence of GMOs. They have an action threshold that's quite low, but you can't be 100% sure. And if you see something that's organic and non-GMO project verified, that's like the gold standard because it follows both standards. You can, so we look at the four main tips to avoid GMOs, by organic, by products that say non-GMO, by products in our shopping guide. And then the other one is to avoid the at-risk ingredients. Avoid anything derived from corn or soy or cottonseed or canola or sugar beets or the microorganisms that produce aspartame. And these derivatives are listed in our guide. And some are always produced from a GMO and sometimes they're sometimes produced. So it's hard to know the level of risk because there's too many unknowns. You had said that um, if, they, if these large companies like McDonald's saw a 5% drop in the basically market share of GMO products that they, you'd think they'd be convinced to drop it. 
Um, but you said in Europe that they have dropped it already because there was less of a demand. I'm curious if you know what percentage of a drop there was in Europe that caused them to, to stop selling GMO products. Well, when I say a drop in market share, it's not a 5% drop in market share that I think will do it. It's 5% of U.S. shoppers avoiding GMOs. I think the actual drop in market share that will cause it will be a lot less than 5%. Some of those people who would be in that 5% will never eat at McDonald's anyway, and they're not going to notice it. But I think when you hit 15 million Americans avoiding brands that contain GMOs, then you're going to start seeing some of the major brands having a drop in market share. The... Uh, the kickout in Europe happened in 10 weeks from the time the gag order was lifted. And it happened because of a sentiment that was now popular throughout Europe that GMOs are unsafe. So there actually wasn't a drop in, in market share at all. There was a changed perception and the companies realized they better get on board. At that point, no one was offering non-GM products except one small chain in the UK. Everyone else was not paying attention. But as soon as it hit the fan, then they realized they had to remove it. So there doesn't seem to be too many human studies gone on. Why is there not too many uh, epidemiological studies? Does industry really have that much sway over the funding? Yeah, you answered your question. <laughs> they have basically nearly 100% control. They don't actually release seeds for testing. They have a, a patent over the seeds and the crops, so they typically disallow independent research. 26 entomologists and environmental scientists wrote a letter, an open letter. They hid their names, but they wrote a letter to the EPA saying there's no independent studies going on because we're not allowed to have access to the patented seeds to do the studies. And if they, they completely control who does it and what's reported, and they get a chance to review and, and just determine what data gets released. If studies are done by independent scientists, they're attacked viciously. And Ignacio Cipella said that this has caused it to be very difficult to get anyone to do research in this field. One uh, senior scientist I know said he knows dozens of scientists that refuse to do any more research in these fields because they don't want to sustain the attacks on themselves and their families. So there could be a time, 5, 10, 15 years, when people just do not grow or eat corn anymore because there'd be too much risk that those, is that, and wheat and sugar, is that a possibility? Like there'd be a um, no more polar bears and no more corn? Yes, there is a possibility, and here's an example. Uh, India was going to introduce BT eggplant. Hardly any studies on the safety. They've got thousands of varieties of eggplant. Eggplant cross-pollinates. Monsanto wanted their BT eggplant approved. Well, there was an uprising against the BT eggplant, and it got stopped. But what if it didn't get stopped? What if it was introduced, started to cross-pollinate, and then 10 years down the road, they discovered that the BT toxin was turning our intestinal flora into living pesticide factories or causing some problem. By that time, the cross-pollination might have gone so wild and so free that, no, that every eggplant in the country was suspect. What are you going to do? You're going to say, if you have any eggplant, it may be causing this new disease. Same with the corn, same with the soy. So if it turns out that it's officially discovered that there's a disease or disorder as a result of a particular crop, you might lose the crop as a whole. Now with corn, you can actually, there are seed companies with pure, non-GMO corn. I know some of the tested, it's absolutely pure and it, the whole system of growing it out is completely secure. So you could eliminate a lot of corn and grow this pure seed in isolated areas without contamination and reintroduce corn. But you end up, if you put it on the same field where the GM corn was grown, you have to eliminate the volunteer kernels that have fallen into the ground that may germinate after a year or two. And so you have contamination that occurs 
through the same field year after year. Then you have the combine equipment that harvests it, so you can end up with corn kernels in there. Or the storage bins, or the trucks, or the barges, or the ships. Throughout the grain chain, you can end up contaminating non-GM with GM. So this is what companies have to deal with when they're going for a non-GM product. Um, so you mentioned that, um, that there, a potential danger is transfer into gut microbiota, genes into gut microbiota, but I'm a little confused about how that might happen and why you aren't concerned that any gene from anything that you're consuming can be transferred over. Why exactly do you think those particular genes will transfer into gut microbiota? I'm so glad you asked that question. I love this question. <laughs> um, plant genes don't typically transfer to gut bacteria, and if they do, they wouldn't necessarily express themselves. Bacteria swaps genes all the time. That's part of what they do. But in order to swap it, they need something called homology or similarity. But the sequences in plants are quite different than the sequences in, in bacteria. So the chances of the plant genes transferring to bacterial genes are much, much less. They're also longer. So the chances of it transferring are less. But the genes inserted into most GM crops are from bacteria, not plants. So now the food that we eat contains bacterial genes that have the similarity and the length that are likely sufficient to transfer. If plant genes transfer, there's two good reasons why they probably would not express protein in bacteria. The first is that the on switch, called a promoter, does not work in bacteria. But in the GM crops, they use a promoter typically from the cauliflower mosaic virus, which does work in bacteria. And when the genes transferred to gut bacteria in humans, it also transferred with the promoter. The second reason why plant genes wouldn't necessarily express themselves is that higher organisms within the gene have coding portions and non-coding portions, the codons and the intron. And when they get pushed into the RNA phase, the little mechanical men inside the cells remove the introns and recombine the RNA. So that's how you can produce many different proteins from a single gene. They just splice and dice. But bacteria does not contain introns. So if a large gene from plants got put into a bacterium and it has introns, the people with the clipboards inside the bacteria say, I don't know what to do. They wouldn't know what to do with it. But the bacterial genes that are put into the GM crops have no introns, or at least not in the coding portion. So that means that they don't have that problem. So these are four barriers. Similarity, length, promoter, introns. Four barriers that normally eliminate the possibility or minimize it dramatically that plant genes will colonize gut bacteria. All four of those are dismantled with GMOs, suggesting we might be colonizing the gut bacteria of North Americans. So it's a huge problem that needs to be evaluated. And we don't know if it's the case. We just know that the science theory supports such a horrible thought. Good question. Thank you. Um, in terms of like monocultures and I guess like yellow corn is the most um, widely used, I believe, right? Yellow corn? Of corn. Uh, of corn. Yeah. By the um, way, if, if you're leaving and you would like to pick up a shopping guide, don't feel you're rude to go back. You can buy stuff back there, get a shopping guide for free, get a health risk brochure for free. Please sign up for the free newsletter. And if you want to be part of the non-GMO tipping point network, Go to our website, but you can also check group next to your name on there, and we can uh, be sure to let you know about it. 
Go ahead. So yes, yellow corn is more popular than white corn for GMO. There's no blue corn that's genetically modified, but blue corn chips, for example, may have yellow corn mixed in. Popcorn is not genetically modified at all. Are, are those consumer-driven demands, or like what? Why do certain like crops get selected out for uh, I, I genetic think that modification? It's, I think it's basically the industrial agriculture supports yellow dead corn primarily for animal feed, and and yellow. Corn is used for these corn mills that create high fructose corn syrup and stuff. Um, I'm not sure exactly why they held back on the white corn for so long. Hi, so you mentioned briefly about um, studies where GMOs don't necessarily produce a greater crop yield. Um, but there are a lot of um, people, especially in the international community, with predictions of the world population tripling in the next 50 years. Um, you know, these statistics by the WHO saying that we're not going to be able to meet uh, food demand in 50 years um, without the use of pesticides and GMOs. Um, how do you, I guess, could you, could you elaborate a little bit more about um, these, the Thank data you. that says that Right. that uh, it doesn't produce more. So um, according to a UN study recently, they said organic and sustainable agriculture could double yields in developing countries. There was a study done with 57 countries, 12 million farms, and found that sustainable methods of agriculture increased yield 79%. The Average yield for GMOs reduces as a result of a lot of things. The only consistent, corn, because it produces an insecticide that kills the corn borer, increased yields by 0.3% per year. Whereas the cross breeding to improve varieties, that incre increased the yields by at least double that per year in the United States. We don't need GMOs to feed the world. In fact, organic, when put side by side with GMOs in the Rodale Institute's 30-year study, which did conventional then GM, they have the consistent yields, the same yields, except during times of bad weather, the organic outproduced the GM and the conventional, and there was uh, dramatically less inputs of petrochemicals and, and other things in the organic side, and it was better quality soil and stronger crops. So there are plenty of experts in this area who've evaluated what actually would feed the world. And the ISTAD report, which is the most comprehensive evaluation of, of, the agri of how to feed the world, looks to agroecology and says that's the technique. And they looked at GMO studies and said, maybe someday they'll have something to offer, but in their current state, they're completely useless to our goals. And I interviewed the co-chairman of that report and several authors of that report. In fact, I, w I interviewed them at a conference in Des Moines where a lot of experts in that, in that realm were together. And the co-chairman of the ISTED report gave a talk one night and mentioning that GMOs had nothing to offer. Secretary of Agriculture the next morning came in to, spoke, to speak. I asked him a question about GMOs. When he started going into the Feed the World rap, the audience started to boo and hiss him because they knew the answer. So you mentioned that um, organic certification does not require GMO, I guess. Testing. Testing. Um, what is the criteria that companies have to go to to make the claim that they are GMO free? If someone wants to put non-GMO on their product and it's not non-GMO project verified, and they just want to put non-GMO, there's no standard. There's no definition, which was a problem for years. It was the Wild West. So someone could be like Eden Foods. I know them well. Fantastic system, isolated, testing, used safe seeds, very, very rigorous. Someone else, maybe no testing, maybe just affidavits, maybe no affidavits. And some people that test may have a very low tolerance and some may have a very high tolerance, which is why we needed a standard. So that's why we recommend the non-GMO project verified standard on products so that we have confidence. Yes, uh, thank you. 
I wanted to know what the uh, corresponding dangers are of the use of uh, recombinant organisms in the production of pharmaceuticals. Well, you know, it's less because you don't have these organisms out in the wild cross-pollinating and stuff. But in the case of L-tryptophan, which is what I know best, I don't know the details much of the others. So tryptophan is what I've studied. They put a bunch of genes into bacteria and they produce these inputs into the fermentation broth. It was a sealed system and they ended up with contaminants. Now, the L-tryptophan passed the U.S. pharmaceutical standard for purity and the contaminants were either 0.1% or down to 0.01%. So 1 in 1,000, 1 in 10,000. And yet these contaminants were supposedly, they have no other uh, candidate for this deadly epidemic. Now, when you put genes into an organism, for example, the, it produces a protein. The protein was slightly toxic or could be toxic to the bacteria. The bacteria might have, bacteria might have done something to protect itself. Or maybe there was high concentrations of something causing metabolic pathways to go wild in certain directions. Or, or the process of insertion might have caused a problem in the production of other things. So theoretically, if you can purify it perfectly and you can make sure that its structure is appropriate, because sometimes the stereoisomer or the protein structure may be different, left-handed, right-handed, folded differently, whatever. If you can make sure it's identical, theoretically, you could eliminate the risks of using GMOs in a laboratory, as far as I know. But uh, I think that there needs to be more respect for what can go wrong when using GMOs in laboratories and more tests that are very consistent over the long term. I have a very simple question. Uh, what do these uh, products sell for? <laughs> <laughs> There's some people in the back who want to buy some of the DVDs. <laughs> okay. Everything you have to know about dangerous genetically modified foods, 10 bucks. You can make as many copies of this as you want. Hidden Dangers in Kids Meals, 15 bucks. Both are available to view on our website for free. But you can make many copies of these and give them out as part of your activism. We like to make a lot of things free. We you have, may have answered my question. Yes. Uh, you're, I'm, not a, I'm not a scientist. Your talk Neither am I. So, so <laughs> you do better than I do. Your talk was so full of technical explanation for things it just, I, I love biology, so I got some of it, but I couldn't spout it back if I were trying to convince somebody. Right. What's the best of all your products for a quick course in? I'll tell you, if someone is a reader, I'm a reader. Then Seeds of Deception. Okay. That's stories after stories after yep. stories. Okay. The, the strategy was to weave the health dangers into the stories so someone would get involved with the protagonist, and by the end of the chapter, they'll have the good guy, the bad guy, and they'll have learned about the health dangers sort of as you go along. So you, you know, could speak anecdotally having read your book. Yes, but it's actually, there's a lot of technical stuff yeah. in there, but, but it's, it's, it's stuck in there. I mean, it's more than anecdotal, yeah. but it's done in the context of stories. Okay, great. Uh, and then if you'd like to watch The World According to Monsanto or Scientists Under Attack, the videos will give you a hit in one hour or an hour and a half yeah. that like it'll leave you kind of, whoa, I can't believe that. Yeah, and I, that's a I, great introduction. I don't need any more of that. <laughs> My macro question is, have you had any contact with China? Yes, I was in China um, this year. Just uh, curious, because they're going to be growing more things. Yeah, they, they have a pro-GM uh, policy. They're growing cotton. Uh, the cotton was overrun with pests, so the savings and the, and the extra income that they got in the beginning of their BT cotton experience has now evaporated. Uh, they're growing some corn. Um, they just decided not to pursue growing wheat and rice, which is very good for the rest of the world. Um, I didn't get a sense that a lot of the people in key positions really understood the dangers. Um, I didn't get a chance to speak to key people in key positions, but I, I've been following China for a while. I think that because it's kind of a monolith in that if the people at the top become aware of what's really going on, they will stop it immediately. Monsanto has a huge presence there. The other biotech industries, they meet regularly with 
key players in China. And so the Chinese politicians have a very distorted view. And the, I think Monsanto in particular, they're really experts at taking over a country. They know exactly what to do. There's a whole matrix. They, they take uh, certain people and bring them to the country, to U.S. with scholarships. They take the media and bring them to St. Louis. They get their people uh, through even bribery. They've been you know, convicted of bribery and other things, offering them jobs in key positions. They rewrite the legislation. It's pretty terrible. Uh, one final question yeah, I'll go ahead and ask. Uh, for the daring or fearless researchers that might be at UC Berkeley, what are a few of the studies that you would recommend uh, right now uh, for GMO-related research? Well, I think checking to see if the gut bacteria is contaminated should be easy if you have access to cadavers. And there may be other ways to swab gut bacteria that I don't know about. You can even check the uh, bacteria in the mouth. I think that would be a very powerful study. I think following up on the uh, feeding female rats and genetically modified soy and then counting the dead offspring is a very inexpensive study. It came out in 2005. No one has followed up. I think there's a lot of follow-ups that can be done to the existing studies uh, in terms of the mechanism, uh, looking at the mechanism. I mean, the dramatic, repro uh, not reproductive problems, but immune system problems in mice fed BT corn. But there needs to be more dynamic studies to follow up to see what the mechanism there is. I think it really depends on what someone's expertise is, what the laboratories are, what kind of uh, bold uh, professor they're going to have. Because if you, if you endeavor to do research in this area, you're risking your career, but you're also trying to prevent the risk for the rest of the world. So it's an interesting decision someone has to make. And I would say talk to Ignacio Chapella. Thank you, Jeffrey Smith. It was a pleasure having you here. Thank you.